So I think we'll make a start. So here we are coming together um, around the campfire. That's the, uh, that's the um, theme of today. Now, a bit of housekeeping as we go. So um, as I said earlier, these, are, these groups are quite big, so I'm unable to make them as interactive as I would like. Uh, but we do have a few options. We're going to be using a tool called Mentee to do a little bit of polling and a couple of questions as we go along. So uh, we'll do our best with the technology at hand. Uh, I wanted to lead the group so that they could be as, as big as they grew, um, just to, uh, I guess, have the opportunity for as many people as possible to, to hear things. Um, we have a Q&A function. There's a, there's a um, uh, questions and answer box. You can uh, ask a question in there, and I do have that open. Um, but also we have the chat function. Now, because last the first couple of webinars, things have gone crazy in the chat, I've not really been monitoring that as I go, but Sam and Ang Harad and Richard, who are uh, also showing on your video, my CSOL crewmates are monitoring that, and they will point me in the direction of any key questions that come in there. Otherwise, I just distract myself if I stare at that too much. So uh, here we are in the third webinar uh, of this series of three. Session one was about packing your backpack. It was about the individual um, skills uh, and outlook for remote working. So it was very much about creating your space, uh, your time and your boundaries and the ways that we care for each other. Session two, was a leadership perspective, drew quite heavily on my work around social leadership and conditions for community, looking at leading the expedition. That's where we went on Wednesday. And today is really about um, how culture holds up as we move remote. And it's about how we write our shared stories together. And some of the things that we might lose by being remote that we might not think about. So it's called being um, together apart and uh, I'm happy to have you along for this journey. And I'll remind you, I'm repeating this set of three webinars in full over the next three weeks. So three webinars next week, three webinars the week after, three the week after that, and they're switching between this series on GMT in the, in the UK and sort of primarily in Europe, and then we have a um, Eastern Standard Time in the US and so on and so forth. So feel free to, um, to uh, point anybody in the direction of these. So, uh, yeah, just another overview there. Packing your backpack, leading the expedition, and now being together apart. So, you know, the main shift that we've seen, obviously, through the enforced separation, is that we are all, to an extent, um, camping alone. We're, we've been thrust out into the wilderness, and I'm sure that many of you, like me, have been um, rejigging your space. We talked about that in the first session, how you create your space. Don't just perch on the edge of the dining room table, actually, you know, create and segregate your, your space. Um, so we're probably uh, somewhat isolated and, and set up by ourselves, but how will we remain together? So how are we going to build our campsite? How are we going to create the space for our culture to thrive when we can't necessarily uh, all come out of our tents and and gather around that campfire um, you know how are we going to to do that and that's really um, the the uh, piece that I want to explore today how will we ensure that we still belong to something now to to kick off that question um, Ankara is going to run the first of our mentees now uh, she'll explain how to do this. If you can't take part in the mentee, if you're just running off one device, uh, don't worry about it. It'll only take some minutes or two to do, but I'll hand over to Ankarad to talk you through this question and I'll stop my screen share so that you can bring yours up. Thanks, Gillian. So many of you will have been quite familiar now with our use of mentee if you've been to some of our other sessions. So you quite simply go to mentee.com, mentee with an I, it's just at the top of my shared screen there and use the code 753793. And the question that we're asking is, how do you create a sense of belonging? A nice broad question to get our minds ticking over at the start of this session. <laughs> and a wonderful honest answer to get us started. <laughs> there we are. Our sense of belonging. How do you even know that you belong? You know, I, I, I feel I belong to many communities. Uh, as I shared some of the research in the last session, the, uh, 
In our NHS research, people identified that they believe they belong to at least 15 different communities on a daily basis. But how do you know you belong? Um, sometimes, of course, you are badged as belonging. Perhaps you have a uniform. Perhaps you literally have a badge. Um, perhaps you have a pin that goes in here. Perhaps you all wear the same hat. Uh, sometimes we are thrust into communities that we belong to that we may not actively choose to belong to. Um, you'll find uh, people who are hard of hearing or deaf are part of a deaf community, whether they choose actively to be part of that or not. We push people into a community. Um, shared purpose can give us a sense of belonging, as somebody's saying here. So when uh, Greta Thunberg turned up in Bristol and 100,000 people turned up to support her, um, Maybe people felt they belonged because they came together, but of course at the moment we're unable to come together. Um, what else have we got? Lots of open communication creates a sense of belonging, um, which is good, but you might need to think about what type of communication. So one of the real challenges we see as we move remote is understanding the balance between purposeful and purposeless. So um, typically, we reach out through technology to communicate in purposeful ways. So we are task-based and we are um, aiming to be effective and productive. But of course, as we no longer have the opportunity to bump into each other and hang out, perhaps we need to communicate in purposeless ways just to share our uh, realities, to share our stories. So a wide range of thoughts kicking through there. I'm gonna grab the screen back, I think, if I can. Thank you, Harad. thank you. Let me just um, share, oh, that's the wrong screen. There we are, let me just share that there. Um, so I want to think about belonging um, or the mechanisms of belonging uh, using this conversation about the campfire. So, um, you know, how we find our campfire, how we build our campfire, but what I really wanted to start with is to say as we find ourselves here for some of us one two or three weeks into being more isolated um, this is a time to kind of pause so enthusiasm and energy and momentum has kind of carried us so far and some people are doubtless thriving and some people are doubtless struggling so it's probably a time to bring your teams together um, collectively uh, into a into a space and pause and have this conversation about how we will build our fire. So when you have been in the office, the culture has surrounded and immersed you, not because it lives in the carpet or lives in the mahogany desk or lives in the light fittings, but because it lives in you, you know, in the way that people are together. So as we are no longer together in such a social way, um, we need to pause and uh, and refresh and think about um, what makes the fire, the fire of culture, you know, what makes it. And of course, I've put here fuel and oxygen. So it's not just fuel, you know, you can have the pile of firewood, um, but you don't have a fire unless it has enough oxygen. You know, many years ago, I used to uh, work at the uh, weekends and over the summer holidays uh, as a charcoal burner, making, making charcoal. Um, and to make charcoal, you take wood, which is a perfectly good fuel, and instead of burning it on a fire, you create a kiln, an oven, and you basically toast the wood. You heat it up without burning it. And you achieve that by burying the wood in a, in a mud um, casing, effectively, with a few holes and a chimney in it. So by making the holes bigger, you can let more oxygen in, more of the wood catches fire but you toast the rest and if you cover all the holes up you starve the fire of any oxygen it kills it and it and the heat just toasts the rest of the wood to turn it into charcoal which seems like a lot of effort but charcoal burns with 10 times more energy than wood does so if you can convert your your wood into charcoal you actually ultimately get more energy out of it um, but it's a dance it's a dance between how much of the wood you will burn as you toast the rest of it to make charcoal. If you leave it going for too long, you just start 
burning it all up and you get no charcoal at the end. But if you don't leave it long enough, you just have a load of unburnt wood. And probably something like that will happen as we try to come together to create or to maintain or build our new refreshed culture. We need the fuel, we need the oxygen, but we have to think about, well, when are we, when are we banking the fire? You know, when are we closing it up and starving it of oxygen? And when are we feeding it with oxygen? Um, that's part of our role as leaders to do that, but also part of our role um, within a system is to be mindful of the health of the whole system and to think about uh, who does what. Because, of course, building a campfire, you have to find the firewood and the firewood is heavy, but you also need the kindling. And sometimes somebody has to carry the kindling from campsite to campsite. Um, the thing about uh, making a fire or the thing about creating a culture is that somebody always has to pay the price. Somebody always has to carry the weight. And it's worth being open and deliberate about this to work out who is carrying the weight. Um, of course, some people are charismatic, extrovert, noisy. And we talked in the first two sessions about how others can be silent or silenced um, by the dominant culture. So part of our effort to be together apart is to understand the work that is required to build, maintain, transfer a culture and to understand who is carrying the weight. And of course, as a social leader, to ask what part of that weight can I carry for you? Uh, and that may be through acts of generosity. It may be through an expression of gratitude and support. It may be through something very practical. Quite often, um, not in this body of work, but in my wider work around social leadership, I use a phrase which says social leaders remove the friction from the system. So, for example, here, as we are all remote, one of the things that we may do is reach out to somebody who is quiet in our team or in our network to seek to understand where their friction lies. Is it that they have a terrible broadband connection? Is their laptop old? Are they struggling to manage their work though? Do they have too many meetings on? Um, and seek to remove some of that friction. Maybe you have enough power in the organization to make a change, or maybe you have influence to make a change, or maybe at the very least you have the empathy to let them know that they don't stand alone. Um, and the funny thing about that is communities which are dysfunctional, organizations which are dysfunctional, have a fractured culture. And one of the ways you can measure that fracturing is that they allow people to stand alone. Uh, and typically the people they allow to stand alone are the people they don't like or don't agree with. A healthy, a socially dynamic organization or a social leader will stand alongside someone even if they disagree with them, if they stand opposed. Because if we only care for the parts of a system that we care about, we neglect the whole system. It's easy to use the words that say diversity is a strength, but if we don't act in ways that reinforce that, then we are part of the weakness within the system. And you can see that organizations with fragmented cultures are good organizations full of good people who perhaps don't invest their care widely enough. So being together apart is about a community spirit but a community spirit that reaches beyond just those people who we know and like. So you'll have to forgive me slightly mixing my metaphors here. Of course, I have uh, breached the rules of social distancing and put my tribe here around the campfire together. Um, but I just want to think about, you know, membership and um, belonging. We, we talked a little earlier about how do we, um, know what membership is and perhaps at this time we should be thinking well most of us know what it is because we used to be in a team that was together and now that team is just dispersed but of course you will continue to form new teams you will continue to recruit to induct to move as time goes by that will become where we came from will become less relevant than we where we are now 
So we need to think actively about what membership is and how will we help new people join our teams. When teams are together, especially when they're together online, a couple of things happen which are important. The first is that they build their own dialect and language. So they start to use words in specific ways and they start to create in-jokes and they start to become self-referential, which is really a definition of building culture. So they build primary and secondary cultures. Now, I'm not going to get sort of deep into this now because in my everyday work, I do quite a lot of work about this, looking at the taxonomy of culture, but I'll describe it like this. When you join an organization and you walk in the door, and you spend your first few days with those people in your local team, you typically form a primary cultural alignment. You work out who's nice, you work out who offered you a chocolate biscuit, who made you a cup of tea, and you form a bond with those people. People describe that takes a matter of hours or days to form those initial bonds, but some people generate much broader networks of connections. They, they generate sort of geopolitical power in the organization beyond that local but they say that takes them two or three years to build that. And many people never achieve it. They get stuck forever at the primary cultural level. Now, as we bring people into our teams, our existing teams that are now online and thriving online, we have to consciously think about what is membership, what is belonging, and how will we bring someone in? How will we enable them to build that social fabric of connection to form a primary cultural alignment with us? And part of that might be to explore within your team, how do you know you belong? Maybe you used to know you belonged because you were in the same office. You came in, you talked about Game of Thrones, you made tea together, you sat down on the telephones and dealt with annoying customers together, and you had a Christmas party, you know, so hence you belonged. But how do you belong when you are online? How much of your interaction is purposeful? How much is purposeless? These are things to explore and to understand, of course, the forces of exclusion. We know from our own research that uh, when we look at exclusion, um, the dominant force that excludes people isn't rules. It's not people being excluded from a team by a rule. It's social exclusion. It's when they are judged, when they are actively silenced. People are silent within a system, not simply because they don't have a voice from within, but because forces outside silence them. And part of our responsibility as social leaders and part of our responsibility as community builders is to be aware of those forces of exclusion and to understand just how many of those forces are held within our individual actions. Because the people who exclude, as often as not, are good people like you and me unintentionally carrying a violence within their words and actions. People are not excluded by somebody evil that sits in the corner and excludes them. They're excluded by high functioning communities that are so internally coherent, they become exclusive to newcomers. I'll just quickly uh, pause and see what we've got in questions here. Um, Kate's asked, is there uh, such a thing as purposeless communication? Well, I, I, I guess um, uh, it's a matter of semantics, Kate. Uh, so uh, in one sense, there's no such thing as purposeless communication, but there are types of communication. So normally the way I would answer that is to say, when we first come together, uh, we tend to start with um, small and safe stories. Um, so we talk about the weather, we talk about our children, we ask about uh, how your journey was. Uh, we don't come straight in and ask you about religion and politics and views on same-sex relationships because those things can be contentious. They can be areas of disagreement. They can be areas of risk that could force social exclusion. Um, but the funny thing about purposeless communication in that sense is that it lays the foundation and social structure. It gives you the bonds to have the more purposeful ones. So it's something about how we stitch together the social fabric before we need it to do anything. So are you, I'm using that language and, um, you know, those the people who know me will know that I, 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 I talk about um, much of my work 
being evolutionary and quite often wrong. So I may be using the wrong language, but I'm using at the moment this language of purposeful and purposeless communication, just to give us an internal barometer when we say, okay, I look around my team, I see Sam here and Ankhavad here and Richard here, and think how much of my communication this week has been purposeful, task allocation, checking in, measuring, how much of it has been purposeless? You know, how are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling? Do you have enough bread? Uh, you know, how much of it is in that um, space? So uh, for me, that works as the structure of my barometer, but maybe you, you, you will find in your work a, a different um, measure or language around it. Um, let me just see. Um, and, uh, there's an anonymous attendee has asked the question, how can one manage challenges of time zones to ensure teams feel that they belong even in different time zones? Well, um, I can only give you a, a, what may be a rather obvious answer to this, which is that if you are in a global organization and if you are in teams that cross time zones, um, democratize your meeting schedules whilst being respectful. So make sure that at least some of your communication, maybe your weekly team meeting, moves around time zones um, so that different people have primacy each time. And the other thing to do, of course, is to publicly recognize and respect those people who get up early or stay up late to be part of it. Um, now, I know that's a really trivial thing, but small things can make a big difference. Now, I'll come back to some questions later. Um, and I'll remind you, of course, if we don't have time to answer your questions here, you can easily find out online. I've had a whole cascade of questions from the previous sessions, so feel free to get in touch through any channel with those things. Um, what have we lost as we've gone remote? Well, we've lost some of those small and safe stories. We, we have them in a purposeful way. So with a scheduled meeting, we may still ask about the weather, but we don't just bump into people in that rather random and ad hoc way. So we may need to engineer that in. We've lost the shared rituals of coffee. So one of the things that remote teams can do is co-create your, your new rituals and have fun with it. So, you know, we have shared before that uh, what we do uh, as uh, a sea salt, what my crewmates here have a, a closed nest meeting. It's a 15 minute meeting every day. And it's not about, it's not about tasks and it's not about metrics and measures. It's about hanging out and being together. Um, and by being playful with your language and your space, uh, I talked in the second session on social leadership about creating your coffee club. You know, maybe you just have a coffee club where you get together each morning, you know, with your coffee just to pass the time of day. Some, somebody might say, well, what a waste. I've got 10 people taking 15 minutes a day to talk about coffee. That's, that, you, know, you know, that's like almost two and a half hours of work you're wasting. But if the social fabric, if the culture of the organization is important to enable you to be effective, I'd argue it's a, it's a good investment. So think about what your rituals will be and um and play with them we we have one uh, ritual we use in our group we I, i've been amazed of course that there's been a flurry of people sharing all sorts of wisdom and advice um as to how you should be a remote worker and i kind of hope <laughs> hope i'm not doing that uh, normally in my normal sessions i say i'm going to give you no answers and no advice whatsoever i have promised in these sessions to be a little more directive with some advice but the thing to remember about any advice i give you is it's my truth and not yours so I saw somebody online saying the key thing to remember as your teams go remote is to always turn your video off. Nobody wants to be looking at your face. Well, I disagree. I would say always leave your video on because I certainly want to be looking at your face. Um, and the thing is, we can both be right. For some teams, not having video on may be exactly the right thing. For us, for Sea Salt, for my crewmates, we always have our video on. And because we have our video on, we also build out little rituals. So we have a, a little ritual like this, where we rub our hands together to show appreciation um, for someone. If someone has done an awesome job, uh, I can show appreciation. Now that might seem stupid. Why are you rubbing your hands together? Are they cold? Well, they're not, but you'll also notice that we have a good discipline about being muted. So my crewmates here are muted. Um, so we can't all clap and cheer. Well, you know, maybe we will later, you never know. But you can be playful with things. But of course, remember that the rituals you create can become exclusive if you don't induct people and bring them into your routine. Culture is not like your laptop. 
So as you all moved remote and you departed the office car park and you had your laptop tucked under one arm and your, your pot plant under the other, you didn't have culture tucked into your back pocket. Culture is the way that we are with each other every day. So why is it important? Well, one reason is that culture isn't just a nice thing to have and the cohesion of your communities isn't just nice to have. Um, social leaders can only be effective and social um, collaborative modes of learning can only be effective if we are able to create meaning from knowledge. Now, any um, philosophers or educational psychologists around here can challenge me all they like on this because I'm, I'm simplifying the language, I guess. Um, knowledge is what people give you. So I can give you this orange brick as a piece of knowledge, but in our everyday work and our understanding of the world around us, we rely on meaning and meaning is created from knowledge. So we, we learn things and then individually and collectively we make sense of them. So if you've had an email from the chief exec telling you what's happening in your organization over the next month, you'll probably talk that through with some of your colleagues and co-workers through either formal or informal channels through WhatsApp or email or on the phone to make sense of it. So the email was knowledge, but what you think about it is the meaning. But to create meaning, you need a diverse and connected community. So the effort we put in, possibly through our purposeless communication, to carry our culture forward, gives our organisation a greater sense-making capability. And in our work on disruption and failure, we see that organisations that lack sense-making ability are ones that fail because they continue to perpetuate the story they have always told. Now, one of the aspects I wanted to explore today is how we will co-create our story on this journey. How will we write our story of this year? And to do that, I want to think about different layers of storytelling. Normally, I would say we have at least three layers. There's a, a personal and individual layer. We're all sat here in the silence of our own heads, making sense of what is going on, seeking to understand uh, the way that the world is now and our own journey through our work and social life. The second layer of storytelling is co-created and the co-created story is different from the personal one because we don't own it. So my story is my truth and you can't influence it. I can think and write whatever I like as part of my story. But our co-created story doesn't have that consensus. A co-created story actually may be a story of difference. It may be that we disagree about things, but we capture that in our story. And an organisational story is, a, is an organisational view on things. Now, to understand, as teams go remote, how we cater for those different types of storytelling is about ensuring people have personal headspace and control to be able to put together their narrative, we have the right kind of opportunities collectively to co-create, to write our story. And of course, that the organisation evolves its narrative. And you can see examples of that um, playing out this week. I, can, I think I can only give you UK examples, so I apologise for that. But we've seen a lot of the retailers being shut down. Um, Halfords is a bicycle repair shop and auto parts dealer. And the management of health had said we will stay open, but the staff said, well, we want to be closed. And individuals were saying, I'm at home caring for someone, I want to stay safe. So three types of narrative battling it out for supremacy in a very public space. So understanding um, these types of story can let us think about our expedition journal. And you may want to do this in a really deliberate and practical way. So you remember at the start, I said, pause, refresh, renew. Maybe one thing you do is come together as a team, as an organization, to start your expedition journal. Where are we now at the end of week one? Where are we at the end of week two? What's working for us? What's not working for us? Because we could be here for a long time. This might be a long journey. The thing about proper planning is that we are prepared for the long haul. If we happen to end the journey early, then we have some spare supplies and it's all good. But if the journey goes on longer than we planned for, we can end up forever 
exhausted and chasing ourselves. So take your time around the campfire and start your, your expedition journal. Okay, let me just check back in with the questions here. Um, so, uh, where are we? So, um, Emily, I'm not, I've not, I'm reading these questions out live. I haven't read them through yet. So, uh, let's see what Emily has been asking. If you have a dysfunctional team where there is little psychological safety, i.e. trust, well, that's timely because we're going to talk about trust in a minute in real life, how do you create a better environment virtually? Can you go from bad to good in times of crisis or do you ideally need to have laid the groundwork first? Well, you know, it's a really interesting thing, Emily, because if you'd asked me this question um, a couple of months ago, I'd probably have said to you, I'd have, I'd have encouraged you to look at the world around you and say, if you are in a, an organization, if you are in a team which is dysfunctional, if you're in a culture which lacks trust, then you work in an organization that doesn't care enough to invest in its people and to create the culture that we all aspire to. So I would be saying, think about whether you should stay there. But maybe today our options are a bit less limited. Um, maybe we need to fight to make things better. So I'll try to share a few things that come out of the research. So you may know we've done for over three years now a global research piece around the landscape of trust. Um, and things I can tell you is this, trust grows in different ways. Sometimes it grows slowly over time. Now, if you feel that the team you're in is dysfunctional, it's unlikely to spontaneously start growing trust. However, in adversity, it can grow quite fast. So maybe our move to remote working is providing a chance to, to reset. And maybe you can use some of the shared storytelling spaces to, um, in order to explore that truth you know you said in your question can you go from bad to good in times of crisis um to which the answer is yes um because there are different types of trust and some trust is found in how similar we are to each other but some trust is found as we become united in adversity so maybe the current situation enables us to reframe the thing which I would say is that trust is quite often held at the cost of somebody else. So because trust is a cohesive force that brings us together, it quite often brings us together at the cost of the others. So I would normally talk about trust in terms of the social currencies of the organization, but to say that we must recognize that the social structure of an organization is not innately inclusive and fair unless you happen to be within the local tribal structure. So tribes, which are trust bonded groups of people are very fair and very lovely and great to hang around with around the campfire. But of course, an organization is made up of many different tribes, some of which we hate, some of which are idiots, some of which we don't even know about. So as you were trying to lay your groundwork, make sure that you work within your tribe, within your team, but also reach out into other areas. The strongest organizations are ones which are interconnected across their rifts of trust. You don't have to like people or trust people to build effective relationships with them. Um, trust is typically the prize which is awarded at the end. It's not something you can sort of pick up and carry with you. The research shows us that trust is very often linked to authenticity. In fact, in a global research project with nearly 70,000 people where we measured this, we saw that people identified many different traits, almost 70 different traits they looked for in leadership. But when they ranked them in order of importance, authentic storytelling, authenticity in action was the number one thing they look for. So if, and I'm kind of addressing this back to you again, Emily, if you are looking to create trust, to create the conditions for trust, I should say, in what may have been a historically dysfunctional group, maybe one approach is through the authenticity of our action. And in this context, that may include sharing our personal story, our personal truth in an open way to see if others will add to it. So 
it's easy for leaders to project strength when in fact we may need to share our uncertainty and doubt, um, which can be a compelling reason for others to do so. How trust breaks? Well, there's a great deal of potential for trust to fracture and break in our current context. Remote teams very often suffer from a lack of trust and it can be an insidious erosion of trust over time as we come to believe that other people are not working hard, are having too much fun, don't understand us, don't even listen to us. So sometimes trust breaks through a single instance. So um, when you gather narratives and stories of how trust breaks, people normally say, Charlie did this thing to me and I don't trust him anymore. So the breaking of trust is typically described um, as a fracture. But it's worth being aware that in the transition from office to virtual, it's more likely to be an erosion. Um, but you may see individual instances and it may come down to this purposeful and purposeless connection. Um, and it may also come down to our marginalized groups. So, of course, a subset of the population of our organizations are not only wrestling with the individual journey um, into remote working, they're wrestling with other types of journeys as well. <coughs> Excuse me. One of them is about their journey of their, you know, through their own mental health, through isolation, through fearfulness, through um, exclusion. So they are making an individual journey. And others are making this journey with their children and families alongside them. They've gone from a household of two to a household of three. They're trying to fit three working days into one actual day. And we also see um, typically women, but could be men who are going back to work from caregiving roles, who may be going back part time into an environment which no longer segregates its time effectively, which no longer understands what a working day is. So. In the first session, we talked about this. How will we maintain time and boundaries? But the thing is, if you're working with your co-workers and someone says, I'm working uh, eight in the morning till six at night, because now I'm based at home, and you say, well, I'm working after I've got everybody set up. I'm working from 10 till 12. And then if I'm lucky, I can manage 3.30 to 5.30. Um, what is going to be the impact on that team? Normally, you would say, the greatest defense we have against the erosion and fracturing of trust is to make what is implicit explicit. Um, and the reason I say that is because when you ask people to articulate what the rules of trust are, they say something like 70% of the rules of trust are implicit, only 30% is written down. So if everybody in your team is working in different ways, do you know what those ways are? Do you trust each other enough or would your culture permit you to write those hours down and compare them in an open way and to say, this is my reality. This is um, where we are. Are you looking for everybody to be writing down the number 40 or how will you deal with it when somebody writes 26 and somebody writes 80? The thing you can be sure of is if you don't make the implicit explicit and if you don't make sense of that together, you are traveling as a team with a culture which is slowly eroding. Let's, um, let's ask that question. I'm gonna throw this back to um, Ankarad for another mentee, if I can. Over to you, Ankarad. Thanks, Julian. Um, it's back to the same code that we used before. Let me share my screen so that everybody can see it. Um, if you can't access it, um, but you can access the chat, do feel free to put an answer in there. What are roads trust is the question that we're asking. So things which are road trust, unmet expectations. Absolutely. So it's important to note there actually that when people talk about that in their narratives of trust, we find that the expectations often weren't shared. So people project an expectation onto somebody else and then when they fail to meet that expectation we just believe that they've breached the contract but the contract never existed again making the implicit explicit is important other things that erode trust broken promises 
yeah, the, often that language is used to describe the fracturing of trust, inconsistency, uh, defensiveness, entitlement, lack of information, hidden agendas, lack of authenticity, uh, lack of information, assumptions is an important one. One of the best things you can do, again, making the implicit explicit, is take your assumptions and articulate them. Sometimes, uh, I do a little activity for that, which, um, which you, you may think is ridiculous or you may want to play, which is writing somebody else's story. So um, what you do is, so at the moment, for example, Sam, who's on the call here, my CSOC crewmate, is, is stranded in a car park in Spain in his camper van. That's where he's, he's living. Um, now, I think I understand that. So how about if I write a story, which is the story of Sam, and I say, this is the story of Sam. I think you wake up every morning in your car park and I think you walk over to the supermarket over the road and get some fresh croissant. And I think you come back and I think you work from 10 till one. And, you know, I could write a story and I'm willing to bet that when Sam read that story, he'd laugh. He'd say, well, you've got the gist of it right, but you've got the detail of it wrong. Now, if we write each other's story, it gives us a structure and a foundation to uh, have a bit of fun around the campfire, but also to share more of um, our reality. Um, Sanders had a question here, um, said, I'm among the 10% of remote workers at my company. Uh, so in the normal day to day, one of the 10%, today we're suddenly 100% remote. And it's been fascinating to see how the awareness of remote working and our needs has been experienced throughout our company. I'm hoping that now we can build our campfire together. Uh, perhaps, so perhaps there's a silver lining to it. Well, I think you are far from alone uh, in that experience, Sandy. I think people are very much um, discovering each other's realities, uh, indeed suddenly thrust into each other's stories. Um, but the question may be uh, what we do about it. Thanks for running that, uh, that um, mentee, uh, Ankarad. Let me pull this back. Um, I was getting dizzy looking at all those things flying in. Interesting how easily we can articulate the things that erode trust, isn't it? I wonder if I'd asked you the follow up in how confident do we feel in dealing with any of those things? You know, the funny thing about social structures um, is that we are all experts, or to put it another way, we all believe we're experts. We all have a set number of strategies that tend to hold us safe within our tribe but the um the, the the reality is that we probably need to learn new skills and many of those skills are skills of interconnection so uh it's about the humility to reach into spaces where we disagree to move beyond the comfort of those spaces that we know to listen and reach into the silence for those stories that aren't being loudly shouted out and the humility to listen to those stories without feeling the need to counter them or block them. Uh, Johnny's asked, um, nailing my feet to the floor here, Johnny, it's a good thing. So what practical activities can we do with remote teams to build trust, especially if we rarely interact outside of a couple of meetings per week? Well, forgive me for uh, stating something fairly obvious, Let's create an opportunity to come together around your campfire. Practical activities around building trust. You could play um, some games that ask people to um, articulate things. One of those things is a reputation game. So you get people to write each other's reputation, bring together a group, not too big, maybe up to 25 people, and you have a bit of fun with it. And you say, we're going to explore reputation and we're going to pick out a pair of people at a time and get them to write each other's reputation. And they do that, and then you get them to share what they've written, and then you can invite other people to contribute to it. And then, of course, you can have a dialogue around that. You can ask people, what's the word that was used that surprised you most? What's the word that you used that uh, worries you the most? What's the word that makes you most proud? Indeed, you can play a really interesting little activity around pride. You can bring a group together, and you can say uh, pride is another social force. It's a sort of parallel force to trust, but it's an interesting one. If you say within this team, within this group, where do you find pride? And ask people to write their story about pride and then analyze those stories. Say how much of, those, how much of that pride is to do with their individual work and activity? How much is the pride they have in the activity of others? How much is invested in helping those people to be successful? 
So you'll see in these examples, I'm using storytelling approaches, but they're really, um, the thing about building trust is that you don't build the thing, you build the space for the thing to emerge. Um, the, the, I've written two books about trust, which are both have the subtitle of the landscape of trust, describing trust as a landscape that we move through. Our role individually as a, as a leader, as a social leader, isn't to walk around with a backpack full of trust and paste it onto people. It is to create the conditions, the space for storytelling, the honest conversations um, in which trust may emerge. Okay, so um, let's just think about um, a piece around exclusion. Um, so what can we do specifically around people uh, as we are finding our ways to be together apart? What can we do for those people who are being either silent or silenced? Well, creating opportunity is one of the best things. It doesn't have to be with everybody. We, um, you can create um, uh, mentoring trees where people reach out one step along each time just to stay connected with each other. Um, again, back to that language, you can't do the thing, but you can create the space and opportunity and support for the thing to occur. So create opportunity for people to be engaged and maybe brief them in advance about what you would like them to bring. And one thing is to write their diary. So write your diary for the week. So if I wrote my diary for this week, I would say, well, Monday I felt full of energy because I was planning for these sessions. I was excited. I was quite nervous. Tuesday, it all went to hell. And I found myself with the, the crying baby and worrying about cooking and behind and, you know, thinking I've not done some work today and tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning, I'm going to be on stage talking about this stuff and I'm unprepared. So that was my fearful Tuesday. Wednesday, I found a bit of sort of calm and balance. Thursday, I felt I was on top of things. And today I'm feeling pretty good. But if I write that story and share it, then again, we can, um, we can build upon that with each other. Is it purposeful? Is it purposeless? You know, you can, uh, you can judge that. Find your space for shared storytelling. Okay, so I'm going to sort of summarize some bits here. I'm going to come back to some other questions um, as well. So Brenda's asked, since webinar number two, what insights have you gleaned to enhance sense making during these conditions? Well, I'll, I'll give you an answer to that one, Brenda, which is that I've been talking to quite a lot of people and I think that uh, for many people, uh, their experience of the move to remote has largely been an overwhelming number of meetings. So uh, I think that some organizations and teams in a well-intentioned way have decided to replace being together with hanging out together. And people have shared their diaries with, you know, eight, nine, 11 hours of, of meetings, which might beg the question, you know, where, where is the work happening? Um, so uh, things to do around that. Uh, one approach is to start using um, tools like Calendly, which let you set up, for example, 15 minute meeting blocks. And then say to people, if you want my time, so if you want my time to talk about the budget, um, bid for an amount of time between 15 and 75 minutes and people will then tend to err on the cautious side. So maybe suddenly your meeting is 30 minutes or 45 minutes instead of an hour. Uh, there's no particular reason why meetings need to be an hour. Uh, so you can play around with those kind of things. Um, and again, if we pause reset <laughs> and renew maybe this is the time to come together and say Pete say to people tell your story of this week how many meetings did you have and when we come together I'd like you to share in one word how you feel about those number of meetings and I would like you to share on a scale of one to ten how effective you've been and then explore the different realities okay so here I'm doing the thing I don't normally ever do, which is saying, uh, this is my advice, this is my guidance, these are the things you need to do. Uh, of course, I feel obliged to immediately encourage you to tear these up and write your own, but um, nonetheless, here are mine. Uh, so light the campfire. Um, 
dedicate the space and the time, create the opportunity to come together. And remember, this is not everyday opportunity, this is exceptional opportunity. So it's not your standard team meetings. Come together to be together, to write your story together. This is the time to think about who is carrying the firewood, who's collecting the kindling, who's making them a cup of tea, who's saying thank you. And remember, um, as a social leader, you don't just look at the noisy system, you look at the parts of the system which are silent and do that mindfully and, and share what you learn. Write the journal, consider writing a war diary, an expedition journal, consider capturing it for yourself, for others. Because right now, what we are doing is the exception. In three weeks, it will be the norm. And in three months or six months, people will be falling over and failing. Um, people will be dropping out. And worse, if we're not careful, we won't even hear them as they fail. So pause and reset now. Think about the fuel, think about the oxygen, think about who's carrying the load. Remember, there is always a price. There is a price to be paid. And if I'm not paying it, then you are. And how comfortable am I with that? Um, earn your trust. This is the time to take actions, um, to earn the trust of others. And sometimes that will mean leading from the front with strength. And sometimes that will mean sharing your stories of vulnerability and doubt. Okay, so Ankarad, I'm going to just ask you to gather some more stories on that vein whilst uh, I try to answer some other questions. Absolutely. This is a question we've actually asked every session this week and it's just been so interesting to hear your reflections thinking back over the session and what you've been thinking of. What one thing will you change? So it's back to Menti and with that code again at the top there or use the chat if that's more readily available. So. And while you're doing the gin bench, I'm pleased to know that the gin bench uh, has Taking stuck off. Um, If anybody's wondering what that is, you'll have to uh, go uh, come along to session one again. Um, things that you'll change, creating some space, that's great. You know, I would say that almost the most important thing a social leader does is to create space. With the caveat that they also make sure they don't just create space for their local tribe, they make space for every voice. They seek out other voices, listen with intent. Uh, find the people carrying the weight. It's an it's a important thing to do. Uh, very often those people are so busy that you don't even hear them. Um, I'm just trying to jig my screen around. I'm on a bit of a small screen today. Just a second. Uh, consider who might be paying. Always ask yourself that. If, if I feel happy, if I feel that I'm winning, ask yourself who is, who is paying. Um, sharing uh, storytelling a reflection with your team. Yeah, think about weekly games. Absolutely. Use your camera more often and smile on camera. It's okay to smile on camera, but you know what? It's also okay to have a cry on camera. It's, uh, I hope you can see there, my crewmates uh, are um, awarding you some social recognition there. Uh, I'll tell you something else we do. We use Slack and Sam, who's our techie nerd, has created a little script and routine. So if somebody does something which we appreciate, uh, if you type ring the bell, um, then Slack will ring the bell for you. It will post up a little message. So we can ring the bell for Sam or we can ring the bell for Encarat. You know, if somebody said to me, is that a very sensible use of time? Are you messing about at the back of the bus? Uh, the answer would be yes. And it's making us a stronger gang uh, as we do so. Um, keeping a journal. Create time for social, uh, for social connection remotely. Absolutely, start your coffee club is really uh, an important thing to do. Um, Okay, so a whole range of things uh, going through. Have faith in yourself. That's, uh, that's a really nice uh, thing to have posted. Thank you for sharing that. You know, do have faith in yourself and be kind to yourself. Again, we talked about that on the individual sessions. Um, I think I said, if I can remember the language I used, it was don't anchor your well-being to a dream. Don't anchor your well-being to this idea of perfection, that every day I will have nine productive hours and I will feed my family and I will look after my relatives and I will carry everybody else's weight. Uh, it's okay to have a crap day. 
it's okay to say, yeah, you know what, it all went wrong and it was pretty much all my fault and I messed about and I wasted time and I also ate an entire chocolate bar and, and then I sat on the gin bench and had a gin. Uh, but today, I'm anchoring my well-being to today. I'm not carrying the weight from yesterday. If I can just grab the screen back uh, from you, uh, I'm just going to share a few final thoughts in our last um, our last few minutes. So I'm going to share a couple of things. The first is I am developing, so we've had these three webinars, I'm developing a workshop, a virtual workshop from it, which is going to uh, be based around a, a shared collaborative space like this, individual activities that you'll go off and do in your own home, and then we're going to have some small groups, you know, paired up by telephone or by other side channels. So keep an eye out for that. If you're interested, drop me a note. Um, we're going to aim to prototype that pretty fast, which will be fun. Um, then I'll remind you again, these sessions, um, these sessions uh, are going to be repeated. So next week on Eastern Standard Time. So in the UK, I think it's between six and seven or seven and eight in the evening. So it's evening in the UK, but obviously um, uh, about lunchtime in the US and just after lunch in the US or West Coast, it'll be the morning. Yes, I'm trying to do that in my brain. West Coast, it will be the morning. Um, Karina's asked, can you repeat the sentence today? I'm anchoring my well-being uh, in today. Don't anchor your well-being uh, in the past and don't anchor it to an aspiration of brilliance. Karina, anchor your well-being to how you do today. We all have off days. We all have bad days. Um, so uh, let me just uh, try and summarize and finish off. We've taken a journey um through these three areas packing your backpack individually um the 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 the, the backbone of, of this is the journey we individually make session two is about leading the expedition but leading as a social leader so not shouting at people not directing people but um ensuring that nobody is lost that nobody is sinking and today i've tried to explore being together apart so we've thought about culture and how will we carry that out of the office and into these remote spaces? We've talked quite deliberately about the deliberate use of space and time. So purposeless communication, shared storytelling, coming together around the campfire, gathering our fuel, um, be mindful, be reflective um, in your practice. Okay, thank you for joining me for these. Um, there will be uh, some other webinars and events coming up. You can find me online, you can find the blog with all the original articles behind this. Uh, if you have any questions, um, reach out. Uh, but for the moment, I will, uh, I hope that you'll all stay in good health and look after each other. And uh, I look forward to connecting again at some point soon. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>